Welcome everyone to our talk about uh, OpenMD5 from a fat client to a scalable omni-channel architecture. That's great. Sounds great. Um, so my name is Andreas Benzing. Um, this is Sibylle Peter. And we're going to talk about OpenMDM first a bit. Don't so you want to present yourself? So Andreas is the lead of the architecture committee. <laughs> And I'm working together with colleagues for Canoe, and we've been um, in charge for the first architecture draft or blueprint. Thanks. Um, so, first thing, who of you knows about the OpenMDM working group? So that's almost everyone. Who is a member of the OpenMDM working group? Uh, pretty much almost the same people. Um, so, here's the, the first sentence of the MDM Charter. The Open MDM Working Group wants to foster and support an open and innovative ecosystem providing tools and systems, which is the first important point, um, qualification kits and adapters for standardized and vendor independence, so that's why we're basically at Eclipse, um, management of measured data in accordance with the ASM ODS standard. We'll get back to that standard later on that has already been in use way before we came to the Eclipse community. So, um, I don't think I have to say much about the members of our community because uh, most of you know them, because most of you are members as well. Um, there's different types of members, maybe that's uh, something important here. We have the driving members, so originally Audi, BMW and Daimler. Um, now there's also Norcom and Siemens and Müller BBM who basically uh, drive the whole topic as uh, the, the main stakeholders behind the entire um, use cases. And then there's also service providers, application vendors and users. Um, so service providers basically uh, intended to work in the entire e ecosystem and provide the services that are used to really run open MDM systems later on. Um, the application vendors who sell the tools around the entire ecosystems and users currently only Tata Motors uh, from India who basically use the results from this working group. Well, a short introduction about the me measurement process. Um, <coughs> first, uh, let me note that test on this slide does not refer to software testing, but to really measure the, the physical properties of engines, car parts of all kinds and so on. So I don't want to uh, bore you with that, um, but stick to the software. First of all, uh, we have to plan a test, really know what to measure actually from such a vehicle. This is, uh, results in a detailed test order, so you have to tell people where to put the, the measurements, the sensor, and, and everything, Then you release this test order. So these two steps should be supported already by the OpenMDM um, system. Then there's external testing done, actually. We have to prepare the test, you know, set up the vehicles and so on. Uh, execute the test, actually, to gather the data, and then we have to import the data back into the MDM system and then it is MDM data, of course. Um, this data is then internally published for reuse so that, first of all, the, the test engineers can look through the data, can look up measurements, can check whether every measurement was as expected, but also for other parties in the entire um, corporation that they can check for, for simulation data, for example, so that they can use the measured data to run their simulations on it. So uh, this is the, the next step here where the MDM data is retrieved by other parties uh, who are not necessarily uh, from the testing department. And then again we have external tools to analyze and process the data, um, which my, and the results of that might then be fed back into the MDM system. And supporting here are maintained methods and maintained test data. Of course we want to deprecate data after some 50 years or so when it's really uh, old, but that's going to take quite some time. There's also some legal issues where you have to keep the data for provenance reasons and to, to prove that these measurements were actually done so that, you know, exhaust fumes and stuff don't get out of hand. Um, yeah, so that's the overall process we want to support here. And then a little bit of history about the working group. 
uh, the, the whole idea started in 1998, uh, 1999 at uh, Odiage. And 2008, it became an open source community, still hosted by Odi. And there came new members to the community, new functions, new components to the software platform, and the code base grew. Um, so basically, there was uh, the need to transition to a more formalized uh, open source community, and that's why last year we transitioned to an Eclipse working group. So um, to show you this, the, the first idea was to have a versatile tool, lightweight, like this Swiss Army knife, which can you know, be used to open bottles of different kinds, to cut everything. And it's a very versatile tool, but it's still very lightweight. So um, but what has been built was a very rich client, which uh, basically looks like this. So uh, you know, there's still a knife but there's lots of just slightly different knives and they've all been put into the system and now it's not that lightweight anymore. So um, there's also really the, the need to restructure the, the entire thing. So that's why we're talking about the architecture here. And to, to give you an idea how the architecture looked for the uh, MDM4 and beforehand, we have the uh, ASM ODS server, which is core bar based. Um, Pretty sure most of you heard about Korba, although it's not that widely in use in, in the Eclipse world. Um, but it provides a very reliable and standardized format to really store data for, for a long time. So um, what, has be, was, what has happened is basically that this Korba interface, which is needed to access the ASM server, has just been reused to pass on the data to different components, from component to component, even to UI components everywhere throughout the system. So that's why we have Corva interfaces everywhere at the moment. Um, and then you also see that basically the ODS server is supposed to really be a very broad uh, API, which also handles file access and corporate directories and everything should be basically channeled through this um, API. Although what happens in practice is that file access is done uh, in parallel to the ODS API because, you know, I don't want to have all the file reads through the Corba interface because it's not that efficient and so on. So there, there grew lots and lots of stuff around this and this originally quite uh, lightweight and, and clear structure was more or less uh, complicated very much. So. Um, so the concrete points were the, what I already said, the Korba and the ODS fall pretty much everywhere, even to the UI, where Korba doesn't uh, have that much of a benefit. So one uh, idea is definitely to separate data access and the logic behind it. Then uh, a second point is that the data access to the ODS um, layer basically masks some bottlenecks. You have to possibility to uh, ask an object for some properties which will trigger a database lookup in, in the um, behind the scenes. And that happens a lot, actually. If you have many, many, many measurements in one test and so on, then this will really be a, a bottleneck. So what we um, identified here is that data retrieval from the database and the storage must be done explicitly. And then we have the separation of concerns. Um, as I said, we have a very monolithic API, which includes all the functionality, and that really uh, hinders maintainability. So first of all, extensions to the API change the en entire thing. And then we have to uh, change all the modules that use this API and update them. So the idea here was modularize the API. And then we have uh, a very common problem, dependency resolution. Um, and, and this has been done in a way which resulted in tight coupling. So basically, even though OSGI components were used, it was not really possible to really uh, exchange them that well during runtime because there were some additional dependencies around it and so on. So uh, this really was also a topic that should be rethought. <coughs> so, um, yeah, let's build OpenMDM5. That was what we started with last year. Um, still be compatible with ASM ODS. As I said, it's an established standard. Shield the COBA interfaces so that they are just at the ODS uh, layer. The ASM actually also is 
trying to remove the uh, entire Colbert dependency, but can't wait for that to happen. Um, provide a method for integrating external data. There's still lots of tools that directly operate on the, the ODS layer, so we have to uh, provide an interface for them. And then break the compatibility with MDM4. That sounds a bit, bit rough, but the idea was really to take ideas and functions that actually work in the, the previous MDM system and transfer these abstract concepts to MDM5 rather than migrating code and saying, yeah, look, we could reuse this and somehow squish it in there that um, was really not the, the goal. And so there was a work split between the original driving members, BMW, Audi, and Daimler, um, who basically thought that separating between the um, API and uh, uh, two different client implementations would be the way to go, and that's how we basically ended up needing an architecture which okay. will now be presented by Sibyl. I need to switch to my door. I might talk loud enough. Something like this. Okay. So this was basically the goal we get, that we should get from this big monolithic um, uh, client or application to design like a flexible, a Desirable, configurable, pluggable, adaptable, resilient, and also not mentioned here, scalable system. Um, so the picture which was used mostly in the working group was that we should build, you know, just having these building blocks and every, um, everybody wants to use, every company wants to use it, just, you know, plugs the components they, and the functionality they want to use, plug them together and whoops, have a running system. Um, so this was the goal, and um, we from Canoe were then, you know, at the starting point, and we said, okay, um, good. Um, of course, we know the use cases which have been implemented so far, roughly, but it was kind of very hard to get the detailed requirements, and also de not only from the functionality, but also, you know, in the different kind of environments where the system is supposed to be run. So this provided very um, difficult, and also. Um, we are not so very fond of, you know, these big architecture design up front because, I don't know, most of you know what happens in the best case, it's just a lot of waste because the system is going to develop differently anyway. In the worst case, case you end up with a system which, which is not designed very good because you try to adjust the needs or the functionality to kind of squeeze it in the original design uh, even if maybe a design change would have been better. Um, in architecture, in the real architecture, you're most likely not going to end up like this because it's visible on the plans very easily. Whereas in software system, there are a lot more unknowns, even if everybody thinks, yeah, just do it, you know, just, you know, make it work like, you know, the old system. Um, we have, we're having quite some experience with legacy systems that it's normally not working like this. Um, so, um, I don't know if you recognize the sentence, the best architectures, requirements and design emerge from self-organizing teams. This is from the Agile Manifesto. We are being an XP company since, I don't know, 15 years. Um, we'd rather believe a bit in this, it's the ELF principle, but we have a problem here, which is not really a problem, but it's a bit of a little <coughs> different context that you know, normal agile teams is because then you want to have a team which is collocated and really have a lot of communication. And this is clearly not the case here with the different working groups, different service providers, um, with these work splits. So you have like different bosses or sponsors which then accept the thing. So this was also not really the way to go. And of course we thought, okay, it's an open source project. Let's look how it's done, so open source software may be developed in a collaborative public manner. This sounds pretty good and I think we really took this into heart by trying to get feedback on our input into the architecture very early. Um, unfortunately, this is a process which needs some kind of learning, one needs to get used to you know, open up or, or get not finished things into, throw that into a public discussion to get feedback. 
And also if you look at um, a lot of open source projects, they look like this, that you have basically one committer or maybe a small committer group <laughs> which, you know, develop everything. So there is very easy to get, you know, you don't have to talk about the common design decisions and then maybe when the initial phase of developing is going on, you have a team which took over here after 2013. It's a bit more widely spread, but you also see um, the differences in commits. So basically we decided going back to the value, so which is like just enough, sometimes also mentioned as a sufficient design, which is you're going to focus on elements where you actually need it. I'm telling this a bit because what we're going to present is basically trying to focus on, on, on the points, on the pain points which have been established, with, established, which Andreas mentioned, and trying to give rather a guide for the emergent architecture because it's, it's probably going to be a period or a development period of several years and things are going to change, also requirements are going to change. So this is the introduction. So those of you who are very familiar with the old system, this is a very rough sketch like I see in a schematic uh, sketch, it was probably more complicated, which was the old system, but what I was trying to point out here is we had the MDM, we had the UI and it talks to the MDM API all over in the components. There were components and there was quite a mix of business logic and data access and then there were, you know, some workers and schedulers and all these infrastructure and they were all just mingled in, in one big box, which is at least the impression I got from the outside. If anybody here which has a very deep knowledge, <laughs> then I, I tried to figure it out, but it was also quite hard actually to get some documentation of the old system for, for the, for, to use. So the picture Andrea showed was the only one we, we kind of found. So let's say it was a bit back box, bit system. And the first step here we introduced is pretty simple. I mean, you're all familiar with that. It's no big thing. Actually, we just introduced some layers, made more separation of also of the concerns or as you can say, the layers have a single responsibility, which is standard design principles. So we have the UI, we have of the business logic and I think the most important thing here is that we, we basically move the MDM API and the MDM API uh, uh, below actual the business logic. The MDM API here is actually two things, it's the API, it's the way how you get the data but it also provide, provides the business object model because not sure most of uh, you in here are familiar with it, but we have to be compatible with the ODS data model, <laughs> but there is also an MDM model which is on top of it, and this has to be represented in some way. And um, I'm coming back to that later, so the business object model belongs somehow to this API, but every layer up on it will know the um, the business object model. This has been a, a decision which has been taken very early that actually these, na these layers, at least the business logic, they all operate on this business object model. So that was the first thing. This other thing was the modularization. Of course, there also ex exists a kind of modularization. I just mentioned there were known components. It was already the, the idea or the, the, men, um, the mental model of a building block system already existing, so this is not really new. Um, what is a bit different here is that we have the components merely in the business logic world and um, they're not going like totally through. So this is a, a graphic from the original or original from the current um, uh, architecture document which is to be found on the website. It resulted in a kind of pretty simple system where you have the building blocks, the MDM component in here. You have more than maybe several applications and you, as you can see the blue component is shared <coughs> between the applications. They can have s different UIs and they all get the data from a kind of data access architectural component which retrieves the actual data from a storage system which is usually or right now an ODS um, server. Um, I think we, as I said, the sufficient design is also 
kind of a notion that you're going to focus on, on the thing which provides most value. So you try to do the thing. And what we thought is most valuable is that um, we try to, to make the components work as such that, that the valuable thing of the component, the business logic, is encapsulated. Um, sorry, it's not readable very well here on the Beamer. But actually, this is, is the logic. And as it already looks, it looks pretty much encapsulated <laughs> by other things around. And um, so we have around different, or the possibility, and this is important, it's a possibility of different communication channel. There's a very special one here, the presentation <coughs> model. This is only needed for, um, com for MDM components which have a UI. And the way we are using here the, the pattern of the remote presentation model is to again protect the common value um, of the system, which is to have the presentation logic, so how it's, um, the UI is actually working together also on the server side. So here is actually a server client split. And this um, enables um, thinner clients. So actually, the, uh, be it a rich client or a web client, they bind the UI to the presentation model, while the logic how the UI behaves is actually down here and is actually shared. So this makes it a bit cheaper to have several UI representations of the client. And it's also a wise investment because these are the, is the area where the technology is going to change most often. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's also these communication channels. They're sometimes also mentioned as ports. <coughs> I'm coming to that. Um, and if you have clear interfaces or clear boundaries about the presentation logic, it's very easy to have the notion then of adapters, which allow the outer system to talk to each other. There is a, is a pattern, it's called ports and adapter architecture. It's also known as hexagonal architecture. It's originally from Alistair Coburn, um, also Uncle Bob, Bob Martin mentioned something similar in, in how the way you should structure your software that it's actually very clear what the business logic is and not as it's much done that you see which kind of pattern or framework you're using. And um, th who is familiar with this kind of architecture? Pretty much everybody. So it's actually very easy. You have your business logic in here. There are ports, there are primary ports or inbound ports, which the outer system talks to the component, and there are secondary ports, which the component speaks against an owned API and, um, to retrieve the data needed. So again, this is uh, kind of the underlying concept. Um, you might ask why so many actually port and they have different used. I think the most important thing or the one which need to be present is the component the API, um, which also serves as the specification of the behavior of the component. So this is actually um, the API which allows you, uh, which defines um, the behavior of the component, which allows you to write test against, which also allows you, you know, to be test if the component does what it says it does. And then there are several possibilities for remote communication. Um, note that it, it's not necessary that every port has to be there, so we would recommend that we imp you implement them then as you need it. And of course, also, you know, you have the API to the uh, MDM um, data. Okay, so again, another picture. Uh, this allows you to build some systems <coughs> which have a certain complexity also in, in a deployment or at runtime. So it basically allows you to have different components in the same JVM, but you could also have components in a different JVM and they can talk to each other. Um, it can get, of course, much more complicated if you decide to use the event bus, then you would need something else like a distributed event bus coordinator. <coughs> it can be quite scalable, but it doesn't have to be. So the idea is here is that when you actually use the components, you're going to look what are your requirements in deployment and you choose the simple um, possibility out there. 
So what about the data we saw here? Of course, we need to access the data. And again, there is um, a kind of uh, an architectural component. It's the data access module. Um, it's not exactly like that in the current state of the documentation. We had quite some discussions with um, the, the people. I don't think anybody's here from the company which actually is right working in implementing this. Um, what is actually the boundary? And I think, at least from our perspective, this would be most clear. You have the API again here, which handles basically then the persistence. You have a kind of adapters also again to the backend system because an ODS adapter to make it work with ODS data is only one a thing which you can imagine. It's probably the first which is going to be implemented, but we probably need something like this which handles um, the, oh, these measurement data can also be stored in so-called ATFX files and we also probably need to handle this. And one requirement that um, there need external tools need to be talked to the system by importing data into the system or to get notified of some changes needs also to be handled. And then of course Again, also the business objects model belongs in this area and here is what Andrea said that there were kind of two, there have been two ways of using the business object model and user friendly way which was very object orientated but had um, hidden, um, basically hidden the fact that with kind of a lazy loading of the data you make a data or a database call which was very expensive so the thing this was a decision taken very early also that this business object model now should basically more like consist of pojos plain old java object because we are in the java environment so they're more like dtos maybe but um, and they don't have any additional functionality they're easy to use the MDM API will be, I think this is developed right now. I heard that maybe the first draft is coming out tomorrow, but I'm not sure. Um, this is, enables everything um, which uses the data to, to have um, queries. And it's probably much more generic than the old one because it doesn't have to reflect the business functionality directly. Okay. So while we are doing this, uh, we also started to work on uh, kind of migrating the first use cases, which is just exploring the data uh, into this new architecture. Uh, from a client, we started on the top because um, working on, on, the, uh, on the API was unfortunately very deli delayed. So what we did, what you see here is actually these are these tests, these measurement tests, the data here they have meta information about it, like the name of a test, the date when it's created, a description. Sorry, this is um, just, you know, dummy data. We didn't get anything else for testing. And what we implemented here is also um, we could load some data and we could um, just filter the data according <coughs> to the metadata they um, provided. And then you have just a normal master detail view. This is the master data. If you click or double click on it, you get the detailed data displayed here. Just to show you, so this is what is actually in, uh, available at the Eclipse. Um, it's still named MDM Web. It's going to be renamed, I think, the project to MDM Components or something like that. And you see here, we basically had two components. We had this Explorer component, which I just have shown. Here, um, implementing as a rich client in JavaFX, um, using Open Dolphin as presentation model to transport it. It has the component API, it has the kind of logic uh, in here. And we also decided while doing this that we need some kind of a data provider component, um, which makes the more generic stuff. And because we didn't have anything from the data, we implemented um, a data access mock. It's also in this project. The real implementation will be in another project then uh, where we just used to read uh, an existing ATFX uh, uh, reader library 
to read the uh, to read the data. We had a little bit of logic to make it <coughs> in a provisional business object model. We just had you know just created what we actually used. But the most important thing is that <coughs> when doing this and when having this component, we noticed that that there might be something else needed for our um, architecture. And this is something we call then as the MDM connector service. So this, this data provider component, I'm not sure if this is going to stay because some part of it's maybe going down here and some part of it is maybe going down here or in here. So what we needed is to bring it all together, we need a kind of service um, because suddenly also the requirement arises that you should not be able, or it not, maybe not suddenly, to only connect one um, data storage, but several. And then you need to have a place um, where you can actually decide which data storage are here. You get the information so that the components can ask which data storage do I have. And it's also something when you do a question, do I need to get the data from all the storages or is just this one needed and so on. So we, there will be a data connector service this is hopefully the next thing which is going to be developed. And um, as you can see, um, we needed a place where this should be going, um, this service. And as you can see, it also fits nicely, sorry, with the adapters because they make then here the adapter to our um, component be used here. And we need a place to store it, and this would be, we called it MDM platform, maybe there's a better name, MDM services was, because it's kind of services. Um, I don't think the naming is, is already fixed. This also had um, an impact, <laughs> or having this layer had an impact on our MDM components in the business layer, because to be able to be managed by a platform, um, they need to provide something like metadata. So for example, what do I need? I do I need what kind of services do I need, what kind of data storage do I need? And they also, because it needs to be configurable, they need to be uh, able to access or to have a runtime configuration. And this is a short overview of the MDM platform. As we said, we the design like that is we decided to concentrate what was most needed at the time to get a starting point, to get the vertical slice as quickly as possible. We're still working on that together in the working group. Uh, but we thought we probably need the connector service as we have seen. We need a, a service which knows how to access the metadata of the component, probably also a configuration service, service which needs to handle the, the thing. Um, something like a bootstrap service, which if you plug together these uh, components is able you know, to bootstrap the things and um, to bring an application up. Of course, security is an issue, so we need authentication and authorization here. You've seen the event bus. This would be belong to the communication service. And of course, when running such a system, you probably want to have something monitoring. And these are still to be designed in detail. So um, when we're going to work on the system, I think, if you come across that you actually really need to implement one of the service, it will be, you know, the, for the people who work on that, it will be their task to make a detailed decision and then, you know, bring it into the architectural committee if it fits the overall view. So here the design gets much looser. So basically very close to the end here. This is the, the big picture, it again shows a possible situation how the system or how these MDM systems could be deployed on very different JVMs with uh, different uh, sources. Um, with having here the platform with at least only two services are mentioned here, the connector service and the event bus, um, which have like different applications. But of course, it could also be very simple. You could just have all the components in one JVM, even the, ser the service connect on the same JVM. Maybe even this module in a very simple environment. And thus you gain the, flexi uh, the flexible, uh, flexibility which is needed for you know, all these um, stakeholders to bring it into their environment. 
So I think these was the fundamental principles which, which uh, drove us to design, design for testability, encapsulate the stuff, make clear interfaces where you can test against. <coughs> uh, also design for learning, try to build a vertical slice as quickly as possible to get the unknowns, unknowns uh, emerge very quickly. Um, just return to design fundamentally, you know, um, separations of concerns, uh, single responsibilities. Um, one thing which we also wanted to do is, while there have been, I didn't mention that, but there have been some technical evaluations basically on what are the co is the communication technology, which is a fundamental, but still make these decisions as late as possible, sometimes also refer to the last response in the moment, so then when you actually need it. And also something which was very good input, implement against standards like J2E, instead of having this system needs a JBoss version XYZ to be run off. So, I think basically this was it. Don't forget to vote. Thank you. And questions? This one. Test and release test order. So, so what would be the outputs of test one? If, if, I, if I just like the background of my question, I think let's say you want to do an engine test and, and maybe you do it on an engine on an engine test bed, so you have to read the test bed, you have to specify all your sensors, you have to specify the test runs that you're doing, you have to specify the way how you measure data. So should all the elements be covered here in step one or what what, what would be my user experience if I go through steps one and two? What kind of interface would I see? But the user experience probably is, is uh, not yet that clearly defined, but the, the goal is really to have the uh, a complete specification of the whole testing environment. So that also includes, we, we have uh, potential new members, I don't know if they uh, are approved in members yet, they want to contribute uh, uh, even a 3D geometry specification of where to put the sensors on your uh, CAD model of the car. So that you have really precise specifications where you put these sensors and, and what type of data they actually measure. That also uh, correlates with the ATFX file format. So basically the, the idea is uh, at the moment to have an empty ATFX file that only specifies the sensors and the, the measurements. And basically you give this empty uh, ATFX file <coughs> to the, the external, I don't know, company or, or whoever <coughs> the department, they will execute the test and basically write them in the, into the ATFX file and that one is then imported back into the OpenMDM system. Okay, but, but th this would be um, location of measurement points, but for example, really the, um, the, the entire test run that you run, that you say, okay, I run up a virtual street across Berlin, now, would this be part here or also I think it, the idea is that it could be part, right? Sorry, you said. I, I also think the idea is that this could be part, yeah. that the system or the components need, I mean, it's a, you need to build these components, you need to build a component which is able to do this, and it's then to be decided what you actually want to do. But I think the idea is to have it that flexible that you actually could do such a thing that you could, you know, define a test with all the test steps needed. And I know that some customers have the requirement that they actually really want to have reading these things and then the test benches should be, you know, have the necessary data or the configuration automatically. Experience as, as a test manager. Okay, I plan that test. 
and protect our security and do something. So what, what is the package of the idea? Well, that is a very interesting topic that has been and is being discussed a lot in the community because, um, as you heard in the keynote before, car vendors are, operate a bit different from the rest of the software world and they always think about what you probably heard yesterday, liability. So they think if I put out a product, even if it's just an, a, a runnable version of OpenMDM, it's a product where our name is uh, somewhere written besides it. And then someone's gonna sue us. So that's how it basically works. Everyone's suing VW now because, you know. Um, so that, that is the problem, how this, this entire domain basically works. And that is why uh, at the moment we're not planning on having an, an actual executable which you can just install because that, that also has to do with a very complex setup of this entire system. So you, you have your storage yeah. service somewhere you have different departments who work in, in different ways, so you really need to think about how this works in your entire company. And it's not just, yeah, here's your rich client, which used to be the, the older, you have this whole client that could do everything, but yeah, it's not tailored to a specific thing, and you really need to do some things. That's why we have our service providers in the working group who are intended to provide this to the final customer. Okay, so, so this means if, if I download this right now, I, I, I don't get a CD with, I, I don't get a, I, I have to do it on my own. Yeah. If, you, what, if you download this at the moment, <coughs> that maybe, you know, the screenshot I showed you, I'm actually, you probably need to have somewhere a native fix file. And you need to build it. But there's read to readmes. It's important to read to readmes because you have to, because this library we used to, to this library we used to read the ATFIX file is, is not on a public repository. So you had to configure it to private, you have to, to the build file to configure it, but then you can build it and then you actually get, if you can read an ATFIX file, you get at the end this screen. This is up and running. This is because we don't have this highly configurable, pluggable system in life, but we just make a client application, a client frame, which actually bundles, using dependency injection, of course, but bundles these components together. So at the moment, you would get this if you try it out. Okay. But this is, is this, I mean, this is just very, very basic. This is kind of the first, the very first draft of how a component could look like, so. I think we can discuss this later on. I think we have to leave. People for the next talk, right?